2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we're going to go. You know, something goes off in a church and everybody thinks they're a comedian. You know how you know how it goes? It's just how it goes. It's how it works. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And what a privilege it is for me to be here with you. And thank you so much, Pastor Norris, for the opportunity. And uh, thank you so much, Brother Norris, uh, for the introduction. And let me just say a thank you to Franklin Road Baptist Church. Thank you for being in your place. Thank you for loving the Lord. Thank you for being faithful to the house of God. And, uh, you know, sometimes we come to revival services and we think this is what everybody else needs. And, and really, it's what we need. It's what we need. Second Corinthians chapter 4, if you found your place and if you're willing and able, would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's word? There are a lot of different ways that the Bible describes the Christian life. Sometimes the Christian life is talked about as sheep in a flock. We have a shepherd. Aren't you thankful tonight we have a shepherd? The good shepherd who laid his life down for the sheep. The Bible talks about us being children in the family of God. And aren't you thankful tonight we have a loving heavenly father who knows exactly what we need when we need it. He brought us out of the family of the devil and he put us in his own family. That's what God did for us. The Bible talks about the Christian life as soldiers in an army. That we're on the winning side. We've been reminded of that in our singing. That the war sometimes is difficult, the battle is hot, but with Christ we're on the victorious side. And Paul here is going to liken the Christian life to something else. He says, we are like earthen vessels. In other words, we're clay jars. We're old clay pots. That's what we are in this life. But what God has chosen to do is unimaginable. <laughs> the clay jar is not impressive. But what God has chosen to do is unimaginable. Look with me at verse number 5 of chapter 4. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side. Can anybody just take a moment and say amen to that point, right? We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Can you say amen on that point? Fox News won't tell you that, but that's what the Bible tells you. That's what the Bible tells you. Look at troubles all around us, of course, and that's nothing new. It's troubles all around us, yet we are not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use your word in our lives this evening. We'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. And in Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said together... Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. 23 years ago now, I took my life savings and I walked into a jewelry store and told the jeweler that I wanted to buy an engagement ring for the girl that I wanted to marry. The jeweler smiled ear to ear, said, you have come to the right place. I'd be happy to help you. Took a black velvet cloth out and he laid it on the counter. He took out this 
black velvet bag and he opened up and he poured out onto the, the cloth all these different kinds of diamonds. And he started talking to me about all the different kinds of diamonds that they were. And I'll just be honest with you, I had no clue that there were this many different kind of diamonds. But he gave me a little magnifying glass and we held him up to the light and he'd pick up this one and he would talk about the, the clarity of the diamond and how this one had a, a particular amount of clarity. You could see through it farther than it had a more clarity than the other ones that he was showing me. Then he picked up another diamond and he talked about the, the color of the diamond. There's a particular kind of color that you really want. And he, he talked about the, the, co the color. He talked about the carat size of the diamond. Some are larger than others. He talked about the cuts of the different diamond, princess cuts and an octagon cut and every kind of cut. And I'll just be honest with you. I didn't care about any of that. I only cared about one thing. And it wasn't the color or the clarity or the cut. It was the cost of the diamond. That's all I cared about. I said, sir, listen, this is all the money I have. So what kind of diamond can this amount of money buy? And that man took my money gladly and said, I got, per I got the perfect diamond for you. He took that diamond, he put it in a ring, he set it in place. He put that ring in a little small box, he took that box, wrapped a bow across the top of it. I stuck that box in my pocket and I left out of that place. A few weeks later, I took Amanda out on a date. I took her to this restaurant that overlooked the city of Louisville. The Ohio River ran right in the middle of it. We were looking downtown Louisville. We had a wonderful dinner. I, I, I kept reaching into my pocket, making sure that box was still there. I was nervous the whole dinner. I don't think I even ate my food. The man that goes, are you hungry? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm just, you know, eating away. I'm nervous. Is she going to say yes? Is she going to say no? Is she going to run away, right? And I'm just kind of wondering. I'm just feeling for that box. Am I going to drop this box? How is this going to go? And, man, we got about halfway through the dinner, and I said, Amanda, let's walk outside onto the, onto the patio. So we walk out onto the patio, and we're overlooking the, the downtown Louisville area, and I'm like, look at the city. Isn't it pretty? And she's like, yes. And as she does, I get down on one knee and I pull out that box and I open it up and I say, Amanda Marie, will you please marry me? And I sang her a song. A song that I wrote only for her. I'm not going to sing it for you tonight. So don't ask. It goes like this, baby, baby, baby. No, that's not it. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. That's a different one. That was a different one. I sang her the song and I said, Amanda Marie, will you marry me? And she went, oh, oh my goodness. Oh. Like, is that a yes? Is that, I don't know what this is. She said, yes. I took that ring and I slipped it onto her finger. We stood up and overlooking the city of Louisville and I said this to her. I said, baby, if you ever wonder if I truly love you, I want you to look down at your finger and be reminded that I am giving you everything I have. If you ever, if you ever try to call me and we, we, you can't get me on the phone or I don't answer right away, I want you to know I am giving you everything I have. If I'm ever away on business and you wonder what I'm up to, I, I want you to look down at your finger and be reminded that I am giving you everything I have. If we're ever in a disagreement and you start to think, well, maybe Dave doesn't love me anymore, I want you to just look right down at your finger and be reminded that I am giving you everything I have. And friend, can I tell you this? God has given us everything he has. 
And he gave us that in the form of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're ever going through a trial and you start to wonder, what well, does God love me? He says this, you don't simply need to look down at your finger. You simply need to look inside of your heart and see that I have given you everything I have in the form of my son upon the cross. You ever pray in a prayer and it isn't the answer that you wanted? Be reminded of this, Christian. God has given you everything he has. This is the promise that Paul is telling us. This is the treasure that we have inside of us that God has given to us in all in the form of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given you Everything he has. There's three truths that Paul writes to this church at Corinth, and he reminds them about this. And I think they're helpful for us. Here's the first one, ready? We are ordinary people with an extraordinary treasure. We are ordinary people with an extraordinary treasure. Look what Paul says in verse number seven, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure here that Paul is writing about is the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of salvation. Paul is saying we have been given this treasure, this treasure of the gospel, this treasure of the glory of God, this treasure of Christ, this treasure of the empowerment of Christ in us by way of his spirit is what has been given to you and me. But listen very closely, this treasure given to us from God has been put inside of an old clay pot. You know what we like to think? We are extraordinary people with an ordinary treasure. And Paul says, no, it's the exact opposite. We ourselves have nothing. We preach not ourselves. No, instead, we preach about the excellency of our God, the rich treasure that God has been given to us. There is a sense in which none of us are anything but clay pots. That's all we are. And there may be some pots that are a little finer clay than other pots, but we're all clay pots in the end. And this is a beautiful way that Paul is describing what we are as Christians. We're simply vessels for God to use. And God has poured this treasure inside of us. Then Paul goes on to say that he has poured this treasure inside of us so that we might be made a blessing to all of the world. When a person looks at the life of a Christian, all he sees is an old clay pot. And you know this as well as I do. Some people, when they look at you and when they look at me, all they can see is the clay pot. All they can see are the limitations. All they can see are the weaknesses. All they can see are the imperfections. All they can see are the failures. All they can see are the times that we have let them down. All they can see are the cracks. But listen very closely, my friend, there is nothing good about you and there is nothing good about me and there is nothing good about us. The only good thing is what God has done done in us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people get bent out of shape because they're looking at clay pots. Can we be the first to admit that there's no one under this tent tonight that's anything more than a clay pot? And the more that you look to a person, the more you are setting yourself up for some kind of frustration or failure later. The more you are counting on a person, 
the more you are setting yourself up for frustration later, but the more you look to Christ, the more you look to him, he will never fail you. He will never let you down. People come and go. Kings rise and fall. Presidents are here today and gone tomorrow. People come in the door. People go out of the door. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your faith is never misplaced when your faith is placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And some people, all they do is look at the clay pot. That's all they can see. That's all they can focus on. The cracks, the imperfections, the weaknesses in ourselves. But you know this just the same? As sometimes when I look at myself, all I can see is the clay pot. When I evaluate the way in which I husband Amanda or the way in which I father my kids or the way in which I attempt to pastor the church that God has given to me or the way in which I try to friend the friends that God has given to me, when I look at these things, sometimes all I can see are the failures, the mistakes, and we get so focused on this. What Paul is telling you and what Paul is telling me is this is the secret to the Christian life, understanding that there are limitations inside of us and God is well aware of our own limitations and that has not hindered him in any way he has put a treasure inside of us he has put a treasure inside of us we're old clay pots this is what's true about a clay pot and that is this it's fragile it's, it breaks easy it's easy for them to get chipped. It's easy for them to get a crack. And Paul is saying, yes, that's us. That's the metaphor for what our life is like. We're earthen vessels, listen very closely, in a very hard world. We're earthen vessels in a very hard world world and Paul is writing this to this church and he's encouraging them to not give up just because you feel like you are being chipped away at time and time again just because you feel like the jar has been bust into a thousand different pieces just because you feel like there's crack after crack Paul is saying this has not hindered the plan of God in any way in fact, this falls into the plan of God because he uses ordinary people to put his extraordinary treasure into. It is not ourselves we preach. It's Christ and him crucified. What causes us to feel chipped away at is unmet expectations and difficult situations and unexpected stress finances and unanswered prayers the daily frustrations of life and they chip away and they chip away and they chip away we're looking at ourselves seeing only our own limitations looking at others seeing only their limitations and we're failing to look to the God for whom there is no limitation at all We break easy. This is not the only thing that Paul has in mind here. There's a second point that I want you to write down under this first one. Not only, is, is, not only does God use ordinary people in extraordinary ways, not only do we break easy, but understand this, we defeat, this is the way in which God has chosen to defeat the enemy. In fact, if you read this chapter, and you, I encourage you to do it, verse number four, Paul says it like this, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of of of, let me start over. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. Paul is saying, look around the world. Of course, there are those who have rejected the message of Christ. Of course, there are those who have turned away from God. Of course, there are those who are living for their own needs, their own flesh, their own uh, satisfactions. Look at the world. Of course, there are those who are blindly going after the gods of this world. And yet, this is the plan of God, that he would use us in this world in such a way that we would 
shine the bright light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in how awesome we are, but we would shine the bright light of the gospel in how awesome he is to use us. This is the way in which the enemy is defeated. I have no doubt at all that Paul here has all the references of Gideon and his army of 300 men in mind as he writes this. Do you remember that army? God had whittled Gideon's army down to about 300. These 300 men were supposed to go and take on the combined armies of the Midianites and the Amalekites which the Bible says have spread like grasshoppers across the valley waiting to take Israel out as their next victim. Gideon's chances of victory are round about zero. You get it? He has no chance of winning. And then on top of that, not only is it 300 versus this innumerable number, but on top of that, God tells them, you're going to defeat them without even a sword and so they take their lamps and they cover them with their clay pots and they take their trumpets and they surround the ridge of the mountain and then right at the moment of which Gideon signaled the trumpets blow the clay pots are broken the lights appear and the Bible says that God causes such a chaos such a confusion to come upon the Amalekites and the Midianites that they turn on one another they panic and they start killing one another you understand there was a very clear message that God wanted Gideon and the Israelites to get and that was this the victory would not come from their own hands the victory would not come from their own resources the victory Victory would not be because of Gideon's great military expertise. The victory would be from God and God alone. If there's any way in which we will be victorious in this life, it won't be because of you. It won't be because of me. It won't be even because of us. It will simply be because of who our God is. The Paul is saying here. We preach not ourselves. All we are is earthen vessels. But God in his infinite plan has put inside of you and me this treasure. Paul says it differently to the church at Galatian. Paul says it like this in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and has given himself for me. Paul says, do not get it confused. This is not about me. This is not about the container. This is all about the content. And the content of the container is the Lord Jesus himself. This falls into the wonderful plan of God. The container is fragile, it's feeble, it's weak, it's broken, it easily breaks. And yet, we should not be discouraged, we should not give up. Why? Because this is the plan of God for us in which, although we are weak... And although we are sinners, and although we are fragile, and although we have imperfections, Christ left heaven, was born of the virgin, lived a perfect sinless life, died an atoning death, raised gloriously from the grave. He ascended up to heaven, and the Bible says he sent his spirit here to earth in the book of Acts. And the Bible says the spirit of God has taken up resident inside of the people of God. He put inside of us a treasure. I don't know about you, but I grew up in church listening to these Old Testament stories thinking, wouldn't it be so awesome to live back then? Wouldn't you love one time to be a part of some amazing Old Testament story where the water just parts or the fire just falls or God shows up and shows out in some amazing way? But I want you to think of this. The Old Testament characters, they don't read the story of their lives thinking, we had it so good. The Old Testament characters look at you and me and think, can you imagine what it would be like for the Spirit of Christ 
Christ to reside inside of us. I don't have to go to a temple. I don't have to fulfill the law. I don't got to go to the tabernacle. God's spirit lives in me. You're a believer tonight. God's spirit lives in you. We're ordinary people who've been given an extraordinary treasure. This is the life that God has called you and me to live. Paul says it a different way to the church at Colossae in chapter 1, verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. The presence of Christ, listen very closely. The presence of Christ changes everything. The presence of Christ changes our affections. The presence of Christ changes our attitude. The presence of Christ changes our reactions. The presence of Christ changes our responses. The presence of Christ changes our objections. The presence of Christ changes our mission. The presence of Christ changes our purpose. Paul knew his limitations. He knew his weaknesses. He knew his failures. But beyond that, Paul understood the limitless power of God that we have nothing but weakness but what we have is the infinite God who has no weakness at all and God does not choose you and me because we are invulnerable because we are invincible God chooses fragile easily broken people and he fills them with an extraordinary treasure. It's ordinary people with an extraordinary treasure. But there's a second thing I want you to write down, and that is this. It's ordinary people in extraordinary trials. So this is what he says. Here's what we have, verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 8, we are troubled. We have a treasure, but we go through trials. I love, I love Philip's paraphrase on this. Philip says, I'm stressed, but I'm not stressed out. Ever feel like that? I've got people out to get me, but God's not left me. I, I, I've been knocked down, but I haven't been knocked out. I remember growing up, we would watch these wonderful documentaries about the life of a man by the name of Rocky Balboa. I don't know if it's a true story or not. I don't know. We'd, we'd, watch, him, we'd watch him all. I remember watching Rocky IV when it came out. And he beat up the invincible Russian Ivan Drago. And I remember thinking, that's what I want to be like. I want to be like Rocky Balboa. Just take a punch and keep going. Take a punch and keep going and then finally beat the enemy. Our church at that time, we would do on Sunday evenings in the summer, we would do these, what they called family fellowship nights. So different families of the church would open up their homes and then other families would come to that home and it was this time of fellowship. It was in place of the Sunday evening service. It was a great way to just get, get to know other people inside of the church family. It was one of those big potluck things, you know, and everybody could get together and have fun. And typically how it went at our house is every, all the children ended up downstairs while all the parents were upstairs. So we all got downstairs, and I got these boxing gloves for Christmas that year. I put these boxing gloves on, and I was jumping around the basement acting like I was Rocky Balboa. The family that happened to be visiting that day is the Matthews family. I was probably in fourth grade, maybe third grade. Jared Matthews at the time was a few grades older than me. When I replay this event in my mind, it seemed as if I was about the size of Rocky Balboa and Jared was about the size of Ivan Drago. Jared is the assistant pastor at Johnny Pope's church there in Texas. That's where he serves today. He shows even God can use a bad person like Ivan Drago. 
I told Jared, I said, hey, let's box. And he said, I don't want to box. He's three or four grades older than I am. I said, come on, let's box. And he said, I don't want to box. I said, come on, let's box. I'll be, I'll be Rocky, you be the Russian. So we put on the boxing gloves. We tied them up. I'm over in the corner, and I went, ding, ding. And I walked out into the middle of the room, and I thought it was going to go like how it goes on the documentary. <laughs> he was going to slow motion punch me. I was going to slow motion punch him. Wasn't really going to hurt, and I was going to win. That's not how it went. I said, ding, ding, and I ran to the middle of the room, and I'm doing like this, and he just went with one punch. He went, bam, right in my nose, and my nose went, explode and I start screaming and crying Rocky never did that it never hurt him like that I don't know why it hurt me so bad he seemed fine in the Christian life we can say things like well we have trials well difficulties exist there's going to be trouble. There's going to be suffering. We don't think of it in terms of reality. And then every now and then, right out of nowhere, we get a punch right to the nose. That's what Paul is talking about here. We're ordinary people who go through these extraordinary trials this is the struggle that I have I'm sure you have the struggle as well if you were honest and that is I'd like to pick and choose whatever trials I go through want a little bit of confusion and just a little bit of distress but nothing else no no seconds thank you I'm good but we don't get to choose do we whatever God sends our way Whatever God wills for us to go through is in the purpose and plan of God. But Paul is reminding this church at Corinth and he's saying, yes, you're going to be knocked down. But you will not be knocked out. Of course you're going to have trouble. Of course, you're going to have trials. But when you do, God wants you and God wants me to demonstrate a different attitude, a different reaction to the trials we're going through. An obvious love, an obvious joy, an obvious peace. These things that shine out of our lives as a result of the Spirit of God having lived inside of us. Something that can never be explained in human terms, but can only be explained in the terms of God at work in me. But I, I want you to understand this. This is not an automatic response. This is not the natural ways in which we go. This is not the normal tendencies of our lives. And so Paul says in verse number 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. I want you to take a quick note that the life of Jesus always rests upon the death of Jesus. The life of Jesus always rests upon the death of Jesus that in our own lives, for us to fully understand the impact of what it means to have inside of us a treasure, there are seasons of our lives where we go through the process like a death, and yet Christ is providing to us a power which keeps us joyful. 
A power which fills us with love. A power which causes us to be firm and steadfast. A power that keeps us going. That even though you're being handed over to death, we have life about ourselves. Why? Because of Christ. So all of these things that threaten to crush us or trouble us or confuse us or frustrate us or hurt us or persecute us, listen, are actually only opportunities for us to respond like Christ. To trust in God. To obey His Word. To die to the flesh. To be filled with the Spirit. To ask that in those moments... Christ, be glorified in me. Christ, be glorified in me. You say, how can that possibly happen, Dave? Paul in this passage gives us a great little formula. The Lord showed me this a few years ago. I'll give it to you just very quickly here. Verse number one, never forget how much God loves you. Never forget how much God loves you. Look at verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Never forget God has showed you his mercy. Paul says, my, my, my happiness is not tied to the state of the economy. My, my happiness is not tied to interest rates. My happiness is not tied to my level of comfortability. My happiness is tied to the fact that God is rich in mercy, a mercy that he has shown to me when Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. Listen, friend, never forget how much God loves you. That's the greatest truth. Paul, second here, verse number two, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Here's the second one. Never fake who you really are. Don't forget how much God loves you. Don't fake who you are. This is... This is a difficult thing, especially inside of a church culture. It's easy to fake it. It's easy to put the face on. It's it's easy to amen brother and amen sister. It's easy to go through the motions. But Paul is saying here, Paul is saying, no, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not walking in craftiness. We're not handling the word of God deceitfully. There's a sincerity about Paul. There's a sincerity about the message and the spirit of Paul. There's an acknowledgement of his weaknesses, but there's also this acknowledgement of his this sincerity, this authenticity about himself that he says, I am the chiefest among sinners. Paul says, Don't forget how much God loves you. Don't fake who you are. Verse number five, keep the right frame of mind. And this is the frame of mind that it is not about me. It's all about him. Verse number five, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. Don't forget how much God loves you. Don't fake who you really are. Listen, keep the right frame of mind. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. How many of you are thankful to hear the testimony that uh, Brother Norris shared with us? Souls, five souls this morning came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't know if somebody sat in your seat or parked in your parking place, but five souls came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. Keep the right frame of mind. Let me give you this last one. I'm sorry, two more. Verse 16, find moments of renewal. Verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The inward man is renewed day by day. 
You've got to find moments of renewal. It's the wonderful thing about a week like this. This is, a, this is an intentional renewal. It's an intentional revival. Renew me, renew me. But listen, Paul says this isn't a one time a year that happens at the church events. This can happen in your life every day. Verse number 17, last one. Listen, stay focused on eternity for our light affliction. Remember this morning we talked about Paul's PhD in affliction. How many of you would say, I don't think his affliction was very light. If that was a light affliction, Man, I, I complain if I get stuck in traffic on my way to church. Paul says this is a light affliction. Listen to this, verse 17, which is but for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Stay focused on eternity. Eternity is closer than you think it is. How many of you believe Jesus is coming back real soon, right? Eternity is closer than you think it is. Everyone thinks they have forever to live. If I asked you, hey, what are your plans this week? You tell me about all kinds of things you have. What are your plans this month? You tell me about all kinds. What are your plans for the holidays, this upcoming holiday season? Everybody will be telling me. No one will say, I plan on dying. But this is the reality. We've done far more funerals in our church for people under the age of 75 than people over the age of 75. We have but this one life. And Paul says, or James rather says, it's like a vapor that's here for just a little while and then vanisheth away. Listen, you might get 75 years right here, but you're going to spend millions and millions and millions of years someplace other than here. So keep your eyes on eternity. We're ordinary people who've been given an extraordinary treasure. We're ordinary people who go through extraordinary trials. And here's the last one. We're ordinary people with an extraordinary purpose. Look at verse number seven one last time, and here's the purpose. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Just by, by show of hands, how many of you would say, you know, Dave, I, I want people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. How many of you would say, I want that in my life? How many of you would say, you know, Dave, I want my life to glorify and testify of how great my God is. How many of you would say that? Paul says, here's how that happens. That happens because you and I are ordinary people who've been given an extraordinary treasure. And you and I, as ordinary people, go through extraordinary trials. And the way in which you respond to those trials reflects the greatness of our God. The way in which we respond to those trials reflects how great our God is. We want people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We just don't want it to be a cost to us. And Paul says that's not how it works. Paul says death will be at work in me. So life can be at work in you. This means that we must run the risk of embarrassing ourselves for the sake of the gospel. We, we run the risk of, of needing to humble ourselves for the sake of the gospel. We forgive, not because it's easy or in our nature. We, we forgive for the sake of the gospel. 
We show love, not because the people we love are always that lovable. We show love for the sake of the gospel. We pursue unity and peace, not because it's always easy to be at peace. No, we pursue unity and peace for the sake of the gospel. We live with joy, not because we're always happy or always on the sunny side of life. We live with joy for the sake of the gospel. ordinary people who've been given an extraordinary purpose that your life and my life and your trials and my trials are not meaningless but they can bring an eternal weight when we exalt Christ in those trials and in those tribulations I don't know where you are this evening under the tent. I don't know where you are in your relationship with the Lord. But can I tell you this? If you're here tonight and you're going, you know, Dave, I don't really know if God loves me. Hey, listen, friend. God has given you everything he has. He loves you. He's filled you with his spirit. He's paid for you with the cost of his son. This gives our lives here on this earth meaning. Meaning. 